So it's now my honor to introduce our commencement speaker, Kate Johnson, president of Microsoft US. Microsoft has been one of our closest partners literally from the very first days of data science at Berkeley. But that's building on a trust relationship that goes back more than 30 years. But especially today, as the company seeks to quote, to empower every person in every organization on the planet to achieve more, a mission we naturally embrace here at Berkeley. And beyond her role in the company, Kate personifies her own professional trajectory, crossing traditional boundaries that are so intrinsic to data science. Electrical engineering as an undergraduate, on to business at Wharton, and I learned today, she's here with you rather than going to her 25th anniversary of her graduating class. <clears throat> From there, she grew on to leadership roles um, throughout the classical software industry, Oracle, Red Hat, now at Microsoft, investment banking, and really going further to the role of information technology in absolutely everything uh, with her time at General Electric. With Microsoft's profound shift in mission, from putting a PC in every home to empowering people, she stepped into her current role, shaping the technology that underlies our connected age and how it comes into being. Along her remarkable path, Kate is a leader in transformation, which makes her particularly well-suited to address this path-breaking class. She's been a passionate advocate for diversity and inclusion, which is so core to our program. We're extremely, great, we're extremely fortunate to have her. Please join me in welcoming Kate Johnson. Thank you, Dean Culler, Chancellor Chris, Dr. Carson, parents, siblings, friends, family members, and most importantly, the data science class of 2019. It's my distinct honor to address the first data science commencement in one of the nation's first data science major programs at the first university that took the risk of inviting me to speak. <laughs> Last chance, Dean Culler, last chance. <laughs> We're good to go? All right. Thank you for letting me share this special day with you, your families, and this extraordinary community. Speaking today, it feels like a really big responsibility, I have to say. I mean, I'm one of the few things that stand between you and tonight's series finale of Game of Thrones. <laughs> I know, I know where I stand. Someone asked me if I was nervous to speak to such a big crowd today, and I said, well, why would I be? It's not like it's the first day of Data 8. <laughs> so no, I'm not nervous, but I gotta say, the more I learn about you guys, the more awestruck I become. All the work you did to create this brand new major, the skills you've gained, not just by studying data science, but by teaching it too. Your ambitious appetite for academics, I learned that many of you are double or even triple majors. And of course, the Sway brothers, they're quadruple majors. If I tried to finish four majors, I would still be in college. <laughs> so many of you have already accomplished great things. I heard that one of you accidentally signed up for the wrong class and used the skills you learned there to write software for NASA that governments use for climate change. That should be Berkeley's new motto, even our mistakes make the world a better place. <laughs> and of course, the most impressive of all, some of you passed Professor Sahai's CS189 class. <laughs> right? Right? And for that, you deserve an extra round of applause. You know, data science technologies have advanced light years since I graduated college, but in many respects, we're still in the wild west of data ethics. The rules are still being written. And so the questions you've wrestled with here, they're not just the most important ones of our time, they're going to be important for a long time. Questions like, 
Where is the line between surveillance and social good? Or how about, how do we design data sets that respect people of all backgrounds? Or, is a hot dog a sandwich? <laughs> In studying data science applications, some of you examined Chicago's traffic data. You built an algorithm to predict the most dangerous intersections. That's a potentially life-saving use of data. It also reminds me of some of the best advice I've ever received, and I think it's highly relevant for you here today. Look both ways before you cross the street. Now, this is something your parents likely taught you years ago, and yes, looking both ways is great advice, especially if you want to avoid being hit by a self-driving vehicle. But to me, it means so much more than that. It means you have a responsibility to look at a problem from all sides. And in a diverse world, one in which we all bring different backgrounds and beliefs to a common conversation, you have a responsibility to look at a person from all sides. We know that one of the best ways to mitigate bias is to create a sense of belonging. It's hard to do, but it really matters. And in the boardroom, I've been in meetings where it's painfully obvious when somebody or some type of person is talking too much. In the classroom, I know you've experienced the same. We won't name names, you know who you are. But what's less obvious is which person or which type of person is talking too little. Often, it's because they don't think their voices are welcome, so they stay quiet, they fade, and they start to feel invisible. If you're one of those people, I'm here to tell you that you're mistaken. You do belong. We want your input. We need your voice. I know it's not always easy, and I know you need help. So to the rest of us who could lend a hand, we have a choice to make. We can choose to notice, invite, and encourage the quiet ones to join the conversation. It's a choice that can yield great impact, and one that I hope all of you will make. I want to share a secret with you. The thing that keeps me up at night is not my responsibility to deliver billions of dollars of revenue to Microsoft, although I do think about that about a million times a day. <laughs> what plagues me at night is my responsibility to create a sense of belonging for every person in my organization. My responsibility to create a culture that can enable change by fostering inclusion in the face of inherent inequality. You see, I know our employees can solve just about any problem, no matter how hard or how complex, but only if we empower them, only if we see them, and more than that, only if they feel seen. And you've been trained well to do that here at Berkeley, for sure, not just because of the diversity of your backgrounds, but because of the diversity of your strengths. Vanisha Swamy is one of our AI engineers at Microsoft before she came to Seattle. She taught Data 8 as a Berkeley grad student. Vanisha said that when she sat in a CS class here, she'd look to her left, she'd see an economics major. She'd look to her right, and she'd see an English major. And she noticed how they viewed the same problem in different ways, through different eyes, different experiences, and different expectations. That's the start of empathy. That's the core ingredient of inclusion. And that's our duty in a diverse world. The tension of the digital era is that even as it brings us together in unprecedented ways, it's making it harder for us to connect as humans. We're tweeting and posting and gramming, myself included, but we're not really talking to each other. We're not really listening to each other. We're not really seeing each other. So before you offer an opinion, before you come to a conclusion, or heck, what about before you conclude a meeting? Do what you do before you cross the street and look, I mean really look, both ways. 
Okay, second piece of advice. Looking both ways is great life advice, but when you think about it, it doesn't tell you the optimal time to cross the street or even the optimal speed. It simply reminds you to be aware of your surroundings. That's why you need to remember this. Chase awareness, not certainty. Who's to say that we know the difference between right and wrong? I mean, I know it's hard to believe, but these funny hats, they don't mean we have a monopoly on knowledge or morality. Ones and zeros are unambiguous. They are certain. The concept of right and wrong is simply not. The ethical questions you've thought about here are hard, one, are hard ones, for sure. Even the hot dog question, especially the hot dog question. But you do have to be aware, aware that data is intrinsically flawed. Just as the world it describes is flawed, just as the people who design it are flawed. And we must be aware that none of these facts absolve us of the harm caused if we abuse the power of data. At my company, we try to reinforce our awareness by testing our choices against a few timeless principles. We ask things like, is this fair? Is it inclusive? Is it safe and accountable? Does it respect privacy and provide security? Elie Wiesel survived the Holocaust and won a Nobel Peace Prize. He said that the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. Well, indifference is also the opposite of awareness. Indifference is also the opposite of action. Indifference breaks down community instead of building it. When we're indifferent, we absolve ourselves of responsibility when it's needed most. Recently, I was with a large group of leaders discussing an important change we're driving in our business. Now, this is a group of amazingly accomplished, sought-after tech execs. But I gotta tell you, it was a really tough conversation. We just weren't getting the results that we needed. And I was getting super frustrated. Well, eventually, we figured it out. Basically, everybody in the room thought somebody else had the ball. They were counting on somebody else to rise to the occasion. Effectively, they were sitting it out. You see, indifference is the enemy of progress. It's the enemy of leadership. And it's most certainly the enemy of community. To make data the best that it can be, we must try to beat its bias. But you can't beat bias if you're a bystander. So how do you keep yourself aware about what's right and fair and just, especially after you leave this campus and the honest conversations it welcomes? I think one answer is in the school's leadership principles, which instruct you to be a student always. And to that I'd add this, please be a teacher always too, because you're the ones who've thought about these questions more than most people. You're not just graduates today, you're not just alumni. Now, you're the experts. Many of you have already experienced the joy of teaching by being TAs, mentors, advisors, and tutors. But to be a teacher, you don't have to stand in front of a lecture hall making announcements like Daddy De Niro. <laughs> you can simply speak up when you think others are sitting out. You can make a difference, especially if you see others are indifferent. So please, don't just go through the motions of designing algorithms. Keep your eyes open. Keep yourself open to talking about the inequities caused by the world's inequalities. And bring that awareness to your newly earned authority. Because if you don't, who will? OK, I won't be much longer. Pre-game for Game of Thrones is coming. So here's my third and final piece of advice for you on your graduation day. There's only one you, so ditch this notion of multiple personas. Back in the 90s, when I was just starting my career, and come to think of it, you were all in the womb, I thought there was a work Kate and a life Kate, and I wasn't alone. Most people in my era were coached to try and fit in to a standard professional mold. So I did, I was compliant. And I wanted to fit in. But then, just as you're all about to find out, 
Life happened. And managing two sets of me became overwhelming. So I did something rare and unique for my time. I brought the real me to work every day. All of me. Every bit of my cateness. And I ditched the idea of a standard mold. I started sharing learnings from my life outside of work, inside of work. And that's when my career really began. Yeah, people were a little shocked at first, for sure, but they were also delighted and disarmed. They got insights from me that they never would have gotten otherwise. Here's a quick example. When I was in my early 20s, I really wanted my boyfriend to be able to read my mind. So badly. I mean, wouldn't that be awesome? Well, spoiler alert, he failed to meet my expectation. So instead, I learned how to share my thoughts with him more often and more clearly. He started doing the same. And as it turns out, great communication has been the foundation for our 30-year marriage. That experience, yeah, there he is. That experience changed me as a person. And I brought that new person to work. It helped me be more direct and transparent with my coworkers, my customers, and my partners. We stopped playing guessing games and got a lot more efficient and a lot more satisfied with each other. Here's a more recent example. 18 months ago, I moved to Seattle away from my family on the East Coast. This means I've had to delegate the solemn duty of caring for my aging parents to my siblings. It hasn't been easy at all. But you know what I'm learning? My siblings are amazing. They're really good communicators, collaborators, and caregivers. And I love and respect them more now than I ever have. Well, that experience changed me as a person, too. So I brought that new person to work with me. And I learned just how powerful it can be to trust teammates with things I've never considered delegating before. My entire team is better off because of it. Those are just two ways that my life perspectives helped me inside of work. But it wouldn't have happened if I stayed locked in this notion that work Kate should somehow be different than life Kate. Believe me, all of us on this side are working hard to build a world that accepts every single one of you for who you are. Don't let us down by dressing up as the person you think we want you to be at work. We want you to be you. We need you to be you. Well, I said earlier that our understanding of how we use data is still being defined. Starting today, right now, it will be defined by you. Over the last few years, you've mastered the skills of writing and manipulating code. Now, we need you to write the code, the code of ethics, the code of behavior for designing and applying data science. We need you to be the models for how one should responsibly wield this great power in a world being eaten by software. You know, it probably won't be as clear cut as the Constitution or the Hippocratic Oath. And you might even have trouble fitting it in a word cloud. Instead, it will be written by your actions, by the example you set through the choices you make. And don't forget that every single day, you'll make countless choices. Will you notice the quiet person in the room and invite that person to join the conversation? Will you think about how your algorithm impacts people of all backgrounds? Will you have the courage to show up to work as your authentic self and invite others to do the same? Every day, in a million ways, big and small, you will make important choices. Class of 2019, none of the problems we face today are really technology problems. They're human problems. It's up to you to make sure the conversations we're having about the responsible use of data advance the conversations of inclusion in real life, too. It's up to you to use the influence of your incredibly valuable degree to create cultures that enable change. 
That's how we make sure that in the age of artificial intelligence, machines won't be the only ones learning. Class of 2019, I hope you remember to look both ways, to chase awareness, not certainty. And remember, there's only one you. Congratulations. Go Bears.